The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the talk. The objective is for you to come home alive. The one black parents have been having for years. My parents had it with me and my sister. My husband's parents had it with him. Plus, a car hydroplanes. Everything changed. Right into a tree. I knew that she was seriously hurt. Watch as one passenger is brought back from the moment of despair. Your prayers move the heart of heaven on my behalf. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Confrontation and conflict. That's the warning from a top Christian leader in Turkey over Turkish President Erdogan's plan to turn the famous Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Opposition to Erdogan's plan is growing around the world, from Europe to Russia to the United States. Dale Hurd brings us the story. It's long been the hope of many Turkish Muslims that the Hagia Sophia Museum would one day be converted back into a mosque. And Turkey's highest administrative court, the Council of State, is considering whether to allow it. The Hagia Sophia was a church for more than 900 years, then a mosque for almost 500 years. And it remains a major symbol of the struggle between Islam and Christianity. It was changed from a mosque to a museum by the founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Ataturk established Hagia Sophia as a museum to underline his vision of secularizing Turkey. And nearly 100 years later, I think Erdogan is trying to do the opposite. The coronavirus outbreak has made Turkey's already weak economy even worse, with trade and tourism dropping dramatically. And some suspect President Erdogan is using the Hagia Sophia issue to shore up his political base and distract attention from the poor economy. So it's not about a prayer space. It's not about building a mosque or providing for a mosque where one does, that does not exist. It's rather using an issue of um, uh, what I call Muslim nationalism or emphasizing Turkey's Islamic identity at the expense of others to mobilize his right-wing and conservative base. Pro Erdogan leader Yunus Genç said, of course someone who is a Christian would be against the Hagia Sophia reopening as a mosque. This is natural. But we're Muslim. And we want this monument to serve as a mosque in Istanbul where Muslims are a majority. Bartholomew, the patriarch of Constantinople, warns turning the museum into a mosque could bring confrontation and conflict. The European Parliament has also gone on record opposing the reconversion. Even some Russian parliament members are upset. And the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has demanded the plans be withdrawn. First built in 360. Destroyed by riots and then rebuilt under Emperor Justinian, the Hagia Sophia has undergone several name changes and even had its dome replaced after an earthquake. And now this historic structure could change yet again. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Oh, we're all getting an education here on the history of Christianity. Uh, and keep in mind that what happened uh, under Mehmet, when, when Turkey con conquered Constantinople and it changed its name to Istanbul, the symbol of that con conflict and the sim symbol of that conquest was taking the Hagia Sophia and turning it into a mosque. This was the place where all the Byzantine emperors were, had their coronations. Uh, this is the place that was the center of Christianity for 900 years. It was the largest cathedral in the world. Uh, and it was a symbol for Muslim conquest. And for Muslims, this is a fulfillment of what was asked for by the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, first Constantinople and then Rome. So for Erdogan to be doing all of this right now, he is very much appealing to a Muslim home base, to Turkish nationalism, and to the fulfillment of the request of the prophet. That's what's happening. Now, what happened 100 years ago? Here's Ataturk. He's, he's coming in as a secular leader of Turkey following World War I. And here was the exchange he made. He kicked out all the Christians. And we've, we've sort of forgotten that fact. Uh, 
Uh, we've forgotten the, uh, the massacre of uh, whole sections of population. Uh, we've, we've, we, we conveniently forget all of that. But the exchange was all of the Catholic Christians, all of the Greek Orthodox Christians were expelled from Turkey in the 1920s. And the exchange was we will convert the Hagia Sophia into a museum and Turkey will be known as a secular state. And that was the appeal to the European powers. Uh, and that's why Turkey is considered to be part of Europe today. For Erdogan to go back on all of that, uh, he is now saying, yes, we are a Muslim state, and yes, we're, we're fulfilling the request of the prophet. Uh, and the rise of Turkey is something that everyone should take a look at as to what are they doing in Syria? Uh, what are their ultimate goals? And uh, from my view of biblical prophecy, uh, the rise of Turkey is yet another sign of the end of days. Where is Gog and Magog? Well, we, back in the 1970s, we said Russia. Um, but for biblical times uh, to today, it's always been centered at Turkey. So will they be the ones who launch an attack against Israel in the decades or centuries ahead? We, we don't know the time or the hour, but this is what's happening. And we, we have to acknowledge it for what it is. This is a rising nationalism in Turkey uh, that's fueled by fundamental religious views. Uh, and in this case, it's Muslim views. And they want to take what was built as a Christian cathedral and turn it once again to be a mosque. Well, here at home, the number of coronavirus cases is still climbing. And now the death rate is rising again. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. Thanks, Gordon. Those new numbers are in for Thursday, and they're not good. Around 60,000 new cases reported with the death toll climbing. At least 867 people died, according to the COVID tracking project. Florida, Texas, and California are reporting their highest death tolls yet, and the virus numbers are still rising in other states across the country. For example, Arizona hit a new record high for hospitalizations. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying cases are spreading because some states just reopened too fast. Despite the uh, guidelines and the recommendations to open up carefully and prudently, some states skipped over those and just opened up too quickly. Overall, the country's daily death toll is still down from its late April high of more than 2,000 a day, and that's attributed to better treatment and because many new cases are in younger people. Experts warn, though, deaths are a lagging indicator. Well, much like other places, churches nationwide have had to shut their doors again as the coronavirus spreads across the country. CBN White House correspondent Ben Kennedy spoke exclusively with task force coordinator Dr. Deborah Burks, who told him we could see a vaccine sometime this fall. Dr. Burks tells me three drug candidates are in the final stage of human trials. Given the recent spike in cases, doses are being prepared just in case, ready to be sent out quickly to those in need. We're making all of those vaccines, even though we don't know if they work yet, so that when we get that first signal that it's safe and it works, then it can immediately, we'll have doses that can really start by going to the most at risk. The U.S. is doing 600,000 COVID-19 tests a day. As a result, for the first time, Dr. Burke said they're able to see the full spectrum of disease. We also have to remember that we've become better at treating individuals with COVID in the hospitals. Treatments like remdesivir and certain steroids have proven effective in treating the virus. Dr. Burks advises states seeing spikes like California, Florida, and Texas to put the brakes on reopening. This, as attention, is also focusing on places of worship. Do you consider churches to be a source for spreading COVID-19? Well, any gathering indoors is a potential spreading event but there has to be virus there. Some churches located in hotspots are closing doors once again and turning back to virtual services, especially with studies pointing to potential for airborne transmission. If churches would move outside, which the weather is beautiful, 
um, and social distance outside, we know that that is much, much safer. If they would wear a mask, we know that is much safer. Now, Dr. Birch said we could have the answer on antibodies by early fall, such as the September, October timeframe. She recommends people who have recovered from COVID-19 to donate plasma, which could be critical to those fighting the virus. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, the White House. Thanks, Ben. President Trump will be holding an outdoor rally tomorrow in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where masks will be strongly encouraged. It is one of the key swing states in this year's election. The rally comes after the Supreme Court gave President Trump a victory and a loss on his taxes Thursday. The court ruled 7-2 to two in favor of a New York prosecutor who wants the president's tax records. By the same margin, the justices kept a hold on banking and other documents about Trump, family members, and his businesses that some in Congress have been seeking for more than a year. Well, the rulings were basically starting all over again, sending everything back down to the lower courts and you start all over again. And so uh, from a certain point, I'm um, satisfied. From another point, I'm not satisfied. Regardless of how the cases play out, the president's taxes and financial records will be kept out of the public eye at least until after the election. Well, we often hear about religious persecution in the usual places like North Korea, China, and Iran. Well, tensions are also running high in the small Balkan nation of Montenegro because of a controversial new law aimed at churches. It's led to widespread protests and detention of some of the country's most prominent Christian leaders. George Thomas brings us that story. 11 countries in this corner of southeastern Europe make up what's known as the Balkans, among them the tiny nation of Montenegro, home to some 600,000 people. For months, thousands of protesters, led by Serbian Orthodox Church leaders, have marched in cities across the country, protesting a law they claim allows the government to seize churches and other religious sites. Those protests are interesting because they're happening as a pray, prayer walks, and they're unique. They're also celebrating the Christian faith here in Montenegro. Legal counsel for the church, Vladimir Loposavic, spoke with CBN News from Montenegro's capital city. He fears the law is a pretext to steal their properties, which include hundreds of medieval churches and ancient monasteries that dot the landscape. In other words, it means that the government is going to try to rob the church, which means to, to jeopardize its, 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 its own survival, survival of the church itself. The law, enacted in January, states that churches must provide proof of property ownership from before 1918 or risk their assets being taken by the government. Leposavic fears such a move might suppress Serbian Orthodox Christians from living in Montenegro and further restrict religious freedom. The government uh, claims that the churches and the temples uh, supposedly do not belong to the church itself. That's led to widespread protests, including clashes with police and repeated detention of those opposing the law, including Orthodox leaders and politicians. Since its independence in 2006, Montenegro's government has fostered closer ties with the West. A NATO member, it's now negotiating to join the European Union. Yet Montenegrins remain divided on whether to foster closer relations with Serbia and Russia or the West. For now, despite government restrictions on public gatherings due to the coronavirus, protesters continue to join church rallies across the country, demanding the government abandon its controversial religion law. George Thomas, CBN News. Gordon, based on George's reporting, it looks like a state-sponsored land grab. Well, that's exactly what it is, and, and it's, uh, it literally makes no sense. Well, why would you go to a congregation and say, unless you can prove uh, some kind of document of ownership uh, that goes back before 1918, and the reason they're picking that date is that's before the end of World War I. So you, you've got to prove somehow an ownership of what is um, tangibly obvious. Uh, there's a church building here, and there's a congregation here. Um, so why are they doing it? Well, very definitely, this is a land grab, and uh, it, I, it makes no sense to me. Why would you stir up this kind of uh, religious conflict? Uh, the Balkans, I mean, there's a reason we call things balkanized. It means that you, you, you are so fundamentally divided on religious and ethnic 
uh, basis that you can't, you know, come to uh, peace with with anyone. There's a long-standing Muslim-Christian conflict. Um, the this is the powder keg that set off World War One. Um, there's been all kinds of conflict in Serbia and Croatia, and uh, this is, you know, why would you stir this kind of thing up? Well, the only thing that makes any sense is you see some kind of profit. For us here in America, uh, keep in mind, government is, is very important. And if a new government uh, wants to do things uh, and, and come after you, well, uh, they, they, they seem to be energized to do it. Consider that when voting. <laughs> <laughs> well, still ahead. A terrible crash leaves one passenger with a traumatic brain injury and a body that was shutting down. How did she make a complete recovery? You'll see the story that her medical team is calling miraculous. But first, the talk that no parent wants to have, even though it's happening every day in black homes. What is it? And what can the rest of America learn from it? Getting pulled over by the police is nerve wracking for anyone, but for African Americans, it can be a matter of life or death. And that's why black parents sit down with their children to have what's known as the talk. Charlene Aaron explains. The deaths of George Floyd and Rayshard Brooks have reignited conversations about racism, unfairness, and the relationship between blacks and cops. That's also the subject of a more personal talk African-American parents have had with their kids for years. My parents had it with me and my sister, my husband's parents had it with him and you know, all of our friends. We know that when you mention um, the talk, you're referring to the conversation you have about interacting with law enforcement. Sonia Whitaker Gregg of Tulsa has since felt the need to extend this talk to her sons. Make sure your hands are visible. Don't put them in your pockets. Um, you know, you can't reach for anything. The key, the objective, is for you to come home alive. Greg first shared this message when they were younger. She recalled telling the boys why they even needed to be cautious playing with their water guns. We had to tell them that they could only play with their water guns um, in the backyard. They couldn't play with them in the front yard. They could not leave our yard and go to someone else's house with, um, with these water guns because of the color of their skin they are not always going to be perceived in a good light. Research from the American Psychological Association has shown that police are more likely to mistake Black boys as young as 10 as older and less innocent. 12-year-old Tamir Rice was shot and killed by police in Ohio in 2014 when his toy gun was mistaken for a real one. Dr. Tony Evans of Dallas's Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship is also using these latest shootings as lessons for the next generation of young black men. I just wanted my my grandsons and, and reminding my sons too <laughs> that uh, because that propensity is there, you have the responsibility to do everything you can to dis de escalate a situation because you never know when it could go left. He shared about being racially profiled as a teenager. I was driving in a white neighborhood and they wanted to know why I was there and what right I had to be there. They pulled me over, held me for an hour. Um, and, um, and it was just because of the color of my skin. Pastor Daryl Scott of Cleveland, Ohio, recently spoke on Capitol Hill about the need for law enforcement to end this profiling, along with excessive force. Scott also enlightened Congress on the reasons behind the talk. I can testify of giving my grandson, who is now of driving age, the talk of how to properly behave if pulled over by police because, because he had the question of a very real fear of the possibility of death at the hands of police. In fact, my very first interaction with police when I was 13 years old resulted in me being roughed up. That sentiment motivated Greg to write Mama Did You Hear the News, an effort to help more Black parents facilitate the talk with their kids. In it, she outlines five practical steps, using the phrase alive, to guide young Black youth through their interactions with law enforcement. 
Meanwhile, Evans believes parents should not only talk about possible mistreatment by police, but also raise their children to be respectful, law-abiding citizens. We need to make sure we're raising the right kind of boys. We're raising boys who are, are, are have dignity. We're raising boy, boys who have a, um, a, a spiritual well worldview. We're, we're raising boys to respect authority. We're raising boys uh, who are not adding to the problem. The church, he says, should help guide that conversation. Well, the church can bring its men and gather all the boys together and say, we want to have the collective talk with you. And, and therefore, we can do that and be a impetus to support the single parents where they need to see a man. Meanwhile, Greg is quick to point out that not all cops are bad. I know that our police officers have a really tough job. They're moms and dads, too. They want to get home safely. Um, and I even say we pray for those um, who wear blue. Even as she prays for her sons and many others. I pray not only um, for protection over them, but I pray that they have discernment to make good decisions and make good choices. It's a constant prayer. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, I think it's time for our entire nation to have the talk uh, and have the talk of why do people die in police custody? What, what is that for? Why does that happen? And can we have a culture where that doesn't happen anymore? And can we have that talk uh, not just in the African-American community, not just in the white community, but can we have it also with the blue community? Can we have all of us get together and say, how can we have a better culture? How can we have better uh, cities? How can we have a better police force? How can we have better neighborhoods? Men and women today need to grasp that it's our personal responsibility for our government for our city, our state, and this wonderful union. Our union is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And for that flame of liberty, and I'm actually worried these days, is the flame of liberty going to go out? Are we still going to have free speech? Are we still going to have freedom of assembly? These things seem to be under attack. For the flame of liberty to continue to shine, we, as Christians, must be the salt and the light. We have to lead this conversation. And that will be the salt that preserves and the light that's unafraid to look at our problems and come to solutions. If we want a country, and I want this, if we want a country with liberty and justice for all, then it's up to us to demand it, to vote for it, and then finally, to be it. Terry? Well, up next, a car crash victim who couldn't stand, walk, or even breathe on her own. But you're about to see her run. How did she make such a miraculous recovery? Well, you'll find out. And then, a teen is lured into the seedy world of sex trafficking. How did she escape after 10 years? Hear her story later on today's show. CBN Films Written in Stone takes you on a beautiful visual journey through the Bible. This film is going to build your faith because you'll discover how archaeology confirms the biblical account of Jesus. Get your copy of the DVD Written in Stone, Jesus of Nazar Nazareth, for a gift of any dollar amount. You can watch it today with instant streaming access on the CBN Family app. Just visit cbn.com slash written in stone or call our toll-free number 1-800-700-7000. And you can also text STONE to 51555. You're going to love every moment that you spend watching this. Gordon? Well, Bruce Ossink called it the moment of despair. His wife was in a coma, her brain was bleeding, and her body was shutting down. That's when Bruce sent out a call to prayer over Facebook that led to a miracle. Bruce and Helena Allsink were driving down I-95 through a rainstorm on the way to a family reunion in July 2018 when their car hydroplaned and hit a tree. Bruce and their three young daughters weren't hurt, but Helena was knocked unconscious. At that moment, everything changed. I knew that she was seriously hurt. I did not panic. 
Um, I just right away like opened her mouth, listened for her breathing, checked her pulse. I felt a faint pulse. Um, she began to take gasp kind of like intermittently. As Bruce held his wife's head still, another motorist called 911. Moments later, an ambulance arrived. Helena was intubated and rushed to Nash Emergency Care Center in Rocky Mount. I think they were concerned right away about her making it. I just remember just constantly, you know, asking God, you know, petitioning the Lord and saying, Father, protect her, be with her. Time was critical. But with the medevac crew grounded due to weather, she had to be taken by ambulance to Vidant Medical Center in Greenville, North Carolina, over 40 miles away. By then, she was in a coma and on a ventilator. They explained she's had a traumatic brain injury. Her brain's swelling. Her body's shut down because of that. So it's trying to self-preserve. She was non-responsive. So that wasn't a good sign. And it was at that point that I was in the, 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 the moment of despair. Doctors put Helena on medication that would keep her sedated and allow her brain to heal. Meanwhile, Bruce sent out a call to prayer over Facebook. Friends and family from all over the country joined with him to pray. I was very, very concerned that she wouldn't make it. Or if she does make it, what level of functionality is she gonna come back to? I didn't know, have any idea what the future looked like at that point. After a few days, the swelling in Helena's brain had gone down and doctors began weaning her off the sedatives to see if she would regain consciousness. You know, with her, her beautiful personality, it was, it was extremely difficult to look at her and reflect upon where she is right now versus where she was. It would just prompt me to pray. After a week, they took Helena off the vent. And so for that hour and some change, it was just amazing. And I felt such victory in that moment. Then uh, she started like struggling to breathe and it was like a coughing type thing. And they had to put it back in. I was there for that. And that was, it was an emergency actually to put it back in. And so that was another very difficult time because here I thought we were, you know, on the fast track to success and then we're put right back where we were. In fact, it was looking worse. Doctors scheduled a tracheotomy to insert a tube in Helena's windpipe to get her off the ventilator and allow her lungs and airway to heal. But her loved ones didn't give up. That became like the big prayer focus. Let's pray that she can be excavated, not have a trach. Then, the day before the tracheotomy, doctors decided to try one more time to take Helena off the vent. When it was successful, it was just huge praise report. But Helena still needed prayer and healing. When she was transferred to Riverside Select Specialty Hospital for rehab four days later, she still couldn't speak or walk. And doctors weren't sure if she would ever fully recover. Her Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a scale of severity, the best you can get is 15 and hers was three um, at the initial scene, which is totally impaired. When I first started taking care of her, she could talk. She was in the bed, um, had restraints on. She had a feeding tube in her nose. Then just two days after being transferred. I walked in the room and I said, hey girl. And she said, hey, in this little raspy voice. She didn't know my name, but she knew exactly who I was. When I came, the first thing I say, go over close to her and give her a kiss and say, I love you. One time she said, I love you too was so faint and I just exploded. I was like, yeah. By day five, she was walking a little bit with a walker, getting up and down to the chair, following commands, having short conversations. After just over three weeks in rehab, Helena went home. It was just beautiful to have her back and to have her back in the kid's life. The biggest thing is that I was thankful I was alive. And so I was just so grateful for that, that I was there for them. Nine months after the accident, Alina completed a 5K run while five months pregnant. Later, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy, Josiah Lee. 
Most people have some sort of deficit. Helena doesn't have any deficits. She drives, she exercises, she probably could run a marathon tomorrow. I mean, that's just kind of how she is and that's how she was before the accident. So it's pretty miraculous. Without prayer, without a miracle, she wouldn't be functioning like she is today. It may not even be here. Whenever I met someone who would come up and say, we prayed for you while you, after your car accident, I would say, thank you so much for your prayers. Your prayers move the heart of heaven on my behalf. Prayers move the heart of heaven. The Bible records it's like incense before his throne. The, the, the prayers of the saints, they go up right to the throne room, right to his presence. And it's like incense there. He's waiting for it. He wants it. He wants you to ask him to do things. He wants you to ask him to show himself strong. That's what he's looking for. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth to do what? To show himself strong to those whose hearts are loyal to him. Now, in this situation, she could have said, well, God, why would you cause the accident? She could have started blaming and all this kind of stuff, all these whys, all this stuff. Here's what, she, here's what happened. They prayed, God, be the solution. Be the solution. And when you do that, you're showing faith that he's there for you. Time and chance happen to us all. Uh, accidents happen to us all. Let's look to the solution. Let's look to the answer. Not ask, why did it happen? But uh, just be like Jesus. When the disciples came with a man born blind, they said, well, uh, whose sin caused this? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? They were asking a theological question. They wanted to get into a theological argument. Jesus wouldn't have any of it. He said, neither. This happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. So whatever you're going through, say, well, the glory of the Lord is getting ready to be revealed in me. And when you have that attitude and you have that prayer that God's glory would be revealed in you, then wonderful things. You just the power of the Lord will break through over you. Now, Terry and I are going to pray for you. But before we pray, we want to encourage you. Some people that have been healed because of prayer. Now, here's Kathleen. She's from Granite City, Illinois. She had chronic acid reflux for 10 years, over a decade. At times, the acid caused her to throw up, and that then burned her throat. One night, Kathleen was up with this at 2 a.m., uh, she had, so she watched the 700 Club that she had recorded. And she heard Terry say, someone has acid reflux and has had it for years. You take all kinds of things, but God is healing you today. Even the soreness in your throat that you feel as a result of the reflux is going to be gone. Well, Kathleen went back to bed. She woke up later and she was completely healed. Wow. Isn't that incredible? The Lord. God's working overnight. God's <laughs> yeah. working when you're asleep. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't need a rest. He is constantly looking, how can he help you? Have that thought. What do you have? Well, this is Rita. She lives in Wickenburg, Arizona. As the New Year started, she began to have severe jaw pain. Two doctors diagnosed her with TMJ, and Rita began using a mouth guard. Then, while watching this program, she heard you say, Gordon, someone, you have problems in your right jaw, and you are not even praying for it, but God is aware. He's saying, I want to heal that right now. All of that pain leave you. You've gotten accustomed to it. God is not accustomed to it. He wants you healthy. He wants you whole. Well, Rita said she knew the word was for her, and since that day, she has had oh, no know. symptoms, no longer <laughs> needs her mouth guard, and she is praising the Lord. God heals people who aren't even asking for yeah. it. When the centurion came to Jesus, just say the word, uh, and my servant will be healed. Well, the servant wasn't asking. The servant wasn't even there. God is limitless. Don't put limits on him. Don't put limits on his grace, his love, his healing. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we rejoice that the glory of the Lord is about to be revealed. 
about to be revealed in the bodies of people watching right now. Stretch forth your hand, Lord, to do miracles. And as people are rejoicing in what you're about to do, we thank you for it. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your miracle power. Do it, Lord. Heal now. In Jesus' name, amen. There's someone you're suffering with uh, sepsis. It's a infection throughout your abdomen, and um, it, it's dire. God, God is healing all of that. He's taking all of that infection, all of that poison out of your body right now. Everything is going to be normal. Your organs are all going to work perfectly. It's going to be an amazing miracle. The doctors are going to be amazed. God has touched you right now. Terry? Uh, there's somebody, maybe this is even more than one person, with Asperger's. And, um, you know, you, you just felt so hopeless about this. It may be for your loved one. I'm not sure. But God is healing that right now putting all things in order, setting everything it is as it is meant to be. And though, though you may not have the diagnosis be different, the, the results of that, the things that you see, the, the challenges that are there are going to be gone. And so just receive that word from the Lord today, that there is restoration, complete restoration being done right now in Jesus' name. Uh, there's several people you've got compulsive disorders um, and um, and it's a variety of things, whether it's a genetic thing or some kind of traumatic injury or that, that started it all or somehow a reaction to trauma. God is healing your mind and he's relieving you from this so that you don't have to be compulsive anymore. He's taking it all away. Just relax into him right now. Let the peace of God guard your heart and especially your mind right now. Let it be cleansed from these thoughts and these patterns now in Jesus' name. Yeah, I feel like there's a, just a, a move with regard to patterns in, in your hearts and in your minds. God is setting some of you who have patterns of uh, behavior that have been disruptive to you, to your family, uh, immoral patterns of behavior, and you've not been able to get a handle on it, though you want to. But right now, you're being set free. Just lift your hands up, begin to praise the Lord, and receive that in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, for you are our healer, our deliverer, our restorer. When we come to you, we come to the answer to every need. Mm. Thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us your good report, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer. And so if you want prayer, we're here for you 24 hours a day. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, paying off $200,000 of debt. How did this grad manage that feat? You'll get her secret when we come back. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. President Trump is all but certain to be reelected. That's according to a political science professor who's developed a highly accurate election model. Long Island, uh, Long Island Stony Brook University professor Helmut Norputh told the website Mediaite that his model would have correctly predicted 25 of the last 27 elections. It says the president has a 91% chance of being reelected. The model also indicates the president will win with a bigger majority in the Electoral College than he did in 2016. The professor said his model emphasizes how much enthusiasm candidates generate in the nominating process and discounts polls, which now show rival Joe Biden in the lead. The professor points out, though, that many candidates have led in the polls in the spring, but failed in the fall. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is providing food for families during the coronavirus outbreak. Judith is a 33-year-old single mother of five in Peru. Before the virus hit, she worked at, in a restaurant and her children were in school. But after the quarantines, she lost her job and food became scarce. She worked as hard as she could to feed her family, but it wasn't enough and she worried her family would starve. She was prepared to beg for scraps in town, 
But Operation Blessing staff in Peru packed bags full of food to distribute to hundreds of families in Judas area. Overcome with gratitude, she said, May God bless all the donors, and my family thanks you as well. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by go going to ob.org. Gordon Terry will be back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Well, Americans are carrying over one and a half trillion dollars of student loan debt. Fallon Scott's share of that burden was enough to stress her out, steal her sleep, and cause her to lose her hair. Well, then one day, Fallon decided to give away $1,000, and that gift helped her pay off nearly $200,000 in loans. Fallon Scott graduated from Baylor University in 2009 with a master's degree in accounting. But she didn't need to be a numbers whiz to see she had a huge problem. I actually borrowed over 100 grand, about 150 grand in student loan debt. Then for me, it was the amount that had accrued to the principal, um, the, the amount of interest that had accrued during that time. That's when the burden, like, that's when it really hit me, when I realized I owed over 200 grand. You know, by the time I left, left school, that's when I felt, I mean, I don't even have words for the amount of pressure, stress, hair falling out from the weight of that number. Fallon got a job, but the massive debt was still there. She struggled to pay it down whenever she could. I think it was even more stressful to come from a background of finance and accounting, knowing what you need to be doing with your money and not being able to do that, you know, every day. I mean, paycheck to paycheck was a good week. I was paycheck to credit card to paycheck. Yeah, there was no, there was, there just wasn't enough. Just wasn't enough. It had me in a very, not just physically sick, you know, stressed, but in a very, bad place emotionally um, and even spiritually like god why me you know like why why like how am i gonna like how am i gonna get out of this fallon's father is a pastor and she learned about the importance of giving growing up in their church she decided to give an extra thousand dollars at her church after her pastor spoke about the blessings of giving to others it was very specific about sowing a seed and just, I don't remember if it was to get out of your situation or if it was specifically about business, but I knew in that moment that I had to sow it. And I feel like God was like, you just trust me and watch what I do in a year. And it was pretty much a year from that seed that shifted everything. A friend told Fallon about a job opportunity. So she decided to check it out. She started her new job in 2014. What had taken me five years and two degrees and a CPA license to earn, I had done that in five months. Um, another five months, by my 10th month, I actually earned a $50,000 bonus. And then the next month, um, I got a $100,000 bonus and was bringing home five figures every month and really able to get myself back where I needed to be physically, spiritually, and financially, and then help others do the same. Fallon was even able to pay off her credit card debts and her car loan. And when she married Devon in 2017, they were able to pay for the wedding out of their savings. Today, the couple continues to put God first in all they do. And Fallon plans to pay off the remainder of her student loan within two years. So what was God's role in this? Every, it's, I mean, it's laughable now, but every little piece, he was just like, just wait, just wait. I've got it planned out. I know what God will do when you sow and do it from a trusting and believing place and a trusting and a believing expectant place. Trusting, believing, expectant place. That's where God wants you to be. Uh, that's what faith is all about. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And one of the ways you get to test God, and it's the only way you get to test God, is through tithes and offerings. And that's exactly what she did. She said, I hear the message. I hear what you want to do. I hear the promise in the Bible. I'm going to act on it. I'm going to trust it. And then I'm going to expect God to come through. For her, it was a gift of $1,000, and it seemed impossible at the time, but God came through. God always comes through. He always watches over his word, and he honors it. He performs it. He makes sure it comes to pass, and he will make sure it comes to pass for you. Now, this isn't a one-time thing. Uh, when, you, when you resolve that you're going to tithe, that means it's a lifetime thing. 
And when you do that, you're showing God, you're showing yourself, you trust him and you expect him to perform because he said, trust me on this, try me on this and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. If you want to start doing that, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. That's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. Or you can do 1,000 Club, and that's $1,000. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, do it now. Call us. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Questions get you killed. That's why Rebecca Charleston remained trapped in the lurid world of the sex trade. Her sleazy boyfriend forced her to sell herself to other men. And for 10 years, Rebecca felt powerless to escape. He told me to get in the car and they'd show me the ropes. And I said, OK. And I found myself in the backseat of a car being told exactly how to ask people to have sex with me and exactly how much money I had to charge them. My entire world flipped upside down on top of me. Rebecca was 17 when she got swept up in the world of sex trafficking. A few years prior, she had moved away from her strict Christian home in Texas, where even God's love had to be earned. I grew up in this environment of having to perform. I had to have this perfect identity and always do what was expected of me. Which is why she kept secret the pain of life's traumas, her brother's suicide, being molested at age 10 and raped at age 14 by someone she trusted. It didn't matter that I was doing what was expected of me. There were still terrible things happening to me. Felt like my only value to people was my body and what they could take from me. And just these repeated instances of men abusing their power and control over me. By 17, she had moved out, dropped out of school, and was moving towards drug addiction, now living with her dealers. To pay her way, she worked at a strip club. I didn't know who I was. If you don't have a strong sense of identity, then you'll let anyone else dictate it to you. And I had all these terrible experiences telling me I was worthless. Rebecca needed hope, and for her, it came in the form of a cheap suit and a nice smile. The man promised her drugs, protection, and love. It doesn't take very much love and attention to make you feel valuable. Just the fact that he wanted me to come live with him, that felt like I was worth something, and that he saw what I was doing and he was gonna get me out of it. Prince Charming's facade quickly faded as he coerced Rebecca into prostitution. Fear and shame kept her trapped and silent. No idea what to do questions get you killed. You know, I remember after the first day thinking, how could I ever look my mom and dad in the face again? You know, how could I ever tell them what's happening to me? How would anybody ever understand? Rebecca would spend the next 10 years moving from state to state, a victim of sex trafficking. Her only taste of freedom came from her stints in prison. It was the first time in eight years at that point that I was able to sleep every night. You know, the first time I ate three meals a day and I didn't have people touching me that I didn't want touching me. My value was what people were willing to pay me for my body. At age 28, she would escape her trafficker's grasp when he was sentenced to two years in prison for tax evasion. Rebecca fled to Las Vegas where she met a new boyfriend and got pregnant. I knew I had to change. I knew I didn't want to raise a baby in that environment. I remember I was in the shower just crying and not having any idea of how I was going to get away or what I was going to do with my life when I did get away. For the first time in a long time, I started feeling burdened to pray. And I just prayed for a way out. I just prayed for a way to change my life so I could raise my baby differently because I wasn't willing to change for myself, but I was for my baby. And I knew I needed God. I knew I couldn't do it on my own. A few weeks later in early 2012, Rebecca went home to Texas where her family took her in with loving, supporting arms. Then at church one day with her family, she learned all she had believed about God was wrong. Learning a, a different version of God, a God that actually has a ton of grace for me, 
you know, and that, that loves me right in the middle of my mess and that I don't have to perform for. He wants a relationship with me in my deepest, darkest places. She soon accepted Christ and later that year gave birth to her son, Isaiah. Rebecca is now the executive director of Valiant Hearts, a ministry dedicated to eradicating sexual exploitation. And she no longer hides her past as she lives in the present as a child of God. I am His beloved. I have value simply because I exist. No matter how many times I mess up or fail or fall down, He's always there waiting patiently for me to look up to Him and realize like, hey God, <laughs> I need you. You know, it's because we have dark places in our lives, whether it's our own sin or something that's been done to us that makes us feel shameful and, and like there's no escape, there's no change. It's because of that that Jesus came. He said, I came to set the captive free. So today I want to say to you, no matter where you are, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, you can have the same grace and mercy extended to you that Rebecca found in her life. In Him, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You can have a brand new beginning. You can start over. Invite Christ into your mess, into your life, into all of it, and ask Him to forgive you, set you free, and give you the new beginning that every believer is promised. If you'd like someone to pray with you, our number is available. It's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. No condemnation, no judgment. Just call and say, I need some prayer. We're here for you. Gordon? We leave you these words from Jesus from the Gospel of John. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.